guys so today we will be doing another finance current affair and the topic that we are going to cover today is of insolvency and bankruptcy code so uh, before starting with this do subscribe to our channel for further videos and for more beneficial regular updates i hope you like my video and starting with the concept of insolvency and bankruptcy code i would like to tell you that what we'll be covering today so we'll be covering the need for bankruptcy code the objectives the framework for the ibc and the amendment so we'll be covering all of these things so moving uh, forward we know that in india uh, the insolvency has been an alarming situation the npas are rising so there was a need to come up with the resolution process with a tight framework so earlier what happened was that multiple agencies were at work like companies act like surfezi then we have the sick industrial unit also sick industrial unit act so all of these multiple agencies were at work earlier before ibc and this caused delays in the process of the resolution so bankruptcy law of india seeks to consolidate the existing framework by creating a single law so notice here that we are talking about a single law here for the insolvency and bankruptcy so under ibc 2016 a bankrupt entity is a debtor so let us understand this through an example suppose there is a company which is a debtor company why a debtor company because it has taken loans from many creditors this is a pool of creditors now creditors may involve the government agencies may involve the financial creditors may involve the operational creditors and many more creditors can be there like bond holders so who are the creditors who lend money to the debtor so when the creditors feel that there is a default so the creditor community could pass could could send an application to the adjudicating authority now what adjudicating authority is in this case it is nclt for companies and drt for individual so nclt handles the insolvency cases for the companies whereas drt handles the insolvency cases for the individuals so the creditors here could send an application in the required format to the nclt and then nclt if accepts the application then it could adjudge the debtor as bankrupt so let me tell you the uh, mechanism by which we see for the financial creditors and the operational creditors that how they file the application uh, what are the timelines for them so in case of the financial creditors if the company makes a default in case of the repayment of the principal amount or the interest payments so the financial creditors could send an application to the nclt and then nclt within 14 days will have to take a decision and if it accepts the application then that application will be known as admission to application and and from that day the timeline that is in 2016 it was 180 days so the timeline 180 days will be started from the day when the nclt accepts the application of the financial creditors and for the operational creditors what happens is the operational creditors send the demand send the invoice demanding the payment from the debtor company and within 10 days if there is no reply from the debtor company the operational creditors can also appeal to the nclt for further resolution process now need for the bankruptcy code so it obviously helps to ensure the confidence of the banks foreign investors and associated companies because if the framework for the insolvency and bankruptcy is regulated and there is a tight framework for it so if everyone in the creditor community will be ensured that they will get their money back or they will have some kind of procedure if the debtor company commits a or 
made a default. So another point here is that it provides clear and speedy process because uh, in comparison to the earlier framework where, com where Company Act and Sarfezi and SIC Industrial Unit Act and etc. and many more multiple agencies were there. So they delayed the process. But now uh, there is a speedy process for everything and these delays are caused due to time taken to resolve the cases in courts and confusion due to a lack of clarity about the then bankruptcy framework which were performed by the multiple agencies here. Now the objectives of the IBC. What are the objectives of IBC? So the first objective that we are going to talk about is time of recovery. So what time of recovery is the institution carry out the bankruptcy proceedings against the company. They have to come out with the resolution process within 180 days. Now this has been amended but I will be talking about the amendments at the last. So now I will be talking about the IBC 2016 the earlier framework and the amendments will be at the last. So it was 180 days plus 90 days. Now why plus 90 days because in some cases the NCLT extended the time to 90 days. So on their decision this extension of 90 days was given to the company. In the 180 days a proper resolution process, proper final resolution plan has to be come out. So this is committee of creditors. So the committee of creditors was formed and uh, the committee of creditors, financial creditors are there but operational creditors are not there. So it is the duty of the financial creditors to give justice to the claims of the operational creditors also. Although operational creditors could appeal to the NCLT as I have told you but they do not form the part of the committee of creditors financial creditors can do so. So in India the time of recovery is 4.3 years uh, and it is high when compared to UK and US. So in UK it is 1 year and in US it is 1.5 years. So another point is I will be talking about is average realizable value. So what ARV is in India uh, the ARV is 20% whereas it is 70% in developed economies. So what is average realizable value? So what a creditor is able to get from a debtor when the company is declared as bankrupt. So this is also a reason why bond market is affected in India as realizable value for the bankrupt is very less. It is only 20% and for developed nations it is 70%. Now cost of proceedings, so when multiple agencies were in work, were at work, so the cost of proceedings was high but now the objective of IBC is to bring, bring the cost of proceedings to a low level. So now coming to the next section, there are two options in the IBC. So restructuring or liquidation. Restructuring if it is financially viable and liquidation if it is not financially viable. So let us understand this. So what restructuring means? It is basically reorganization. It is reorganization, reorganizing the legal ownership or the operational structure of a company for the purpose of making it profitable. And during a major transition like bankruptcy, management may consider to restructure a company if it finds ability that the company would grow. Whereas in liquidation, the whole purpose is to bring the business to an end and distributing the assets to the claimants in the hierarchy that we'll be talking about. Now the examples are in the restructuring. Uh, you all know that in ILNFS, restructuring is happening. There is new board, reorganization is done. Whereas the example of liquidation is Kingfisher Airlines. So the Kingfisher Airlines have been liquidated and it was owned by Vijay Mandya. And all, we all know that what financial viability means. So financial viability is to meet the operating payments, debt, commitments 
and to allow growth so basically when there is uh, ability in a business to grow to bring it back to the profitability channel so that is financial viability so now coming to the next section that is four pillars of ibc so four pillars of I ibc have insolvency professional information utility bankruptcy and insolvency adjudicator and insolvency regulator so talking about them one by one first insolvency professional so insolvency professional may a class of regulated persons who would play a key role so insolvency professional has a key role to play in the efficient working of the bankruptcy process and they are regulated by the insolvency professional agencies in the information utility it would store the facts about the lenders and terms of lending in electronic databases which would eliminate the delays and dispute about the facts when default does takes place next we have the bankruptcy and the insolvency adjudicator so as we all know i have discussed it earlier also that there are two nclt and drt and also the adjudication is uh, by the nclt and drt so nclt It is a forum where the firm insolvency is heard, and DRT is a forum where the individual insolvency will be heard. So DRT is basically for the individuals, and NCLT is for the firms. Now we have the insolvency regulator. So insolvency and bankruptcy board of India is the body. and it will have a regulatory oversight over the in insolvency professional insolvency professional agencies and the information utilities so these are the four important pillars of ibc these all play a very important role in the resolution process of the ibc we understand it uh, through other important sections of this document so next topic is the process that how the ibc works step 1 says that on the day of the default on day 1 of the default a creditor or borrower can approach nclt to initiate the insolvency proceedings so as i have discussed that in case of financial creditors they can go to the nclt uh, after the default has taken place even after the even on the day of the default or whenever the default has taken place they can go to the nclt after that and they send an application to the nclt and nclt has a key role to play here that within 14 days they have to consider the application and and if they accept the application then that is known as admission of application and from that day onwards the timeline for the ibc which has been set that is earlier 180 plus 90 days and now 330 days will start then in step 2 it is when a case is admitted now nclt will appoint an insolvency professional so insolvency professional has a key role to play here because till the time the case of insolvency is not solved uh, he is authorized to run a company for the interim time now he will all, he can also be an interim res resolution professional or simply put it as irp now he collects the information relating to assets finances and operations of the corporate debtor against which the case has been made also he constitutes the committee of creditors and take control and custody of the asset over which debtor has the ownership now in step 3 within 180 days of the lenders committee has to decide on a debt recast plan so a time frame has been mentioned in the ibc that is 180 plus 90 days time frame is there so within the 180 days every resolution final resolution plan has to be made and if, and if the nclt thinks fit then extended 90 days is also given but this total 270 days is without the litigation time whereas the now amended version that is of 330 days it includes the time for litigation so we'll talk about it later 
so then lenders would be given additional 90 days to arrive at a final plan so as i have already discussed it with you the next step four is that if 75% of the lenders agree the committee would go ahead with the debt restructuring otherwise after 180 days the company's assets will be liquidated so in this case a majority of like 75% of the lenders has to agree has to come out with a final plan for a company's resolution for a bankrupt company and if there is no final plan even after 180 days then the company's assets will be liquidated so a company will go for liquidation if a final plan of resolution has not been made by the committee of creditors within 180 days time frame next topic that we will be covering is implementation of the resolution plan so earlier what happened was that whenever there was a default uh, in the borrower's entity account so any lender we have discussed the pool of creditors uh, in the above section so any lender maybe singly or jointly can initiate the steps to cure the default but now a proper procedure has been uh, mentioned by the ibc to have a resolution process including the timelines has also been decided by the ibc so lenders can also initiate the process of resolution plan even before a default so when there is a hint to the lenders about the financial distress of about a company and if the nclt thinks this is a matter of concern so the nclt could also then initiate the proceedings against the company now there is a review period of 30 days so in the review period if the borrower is reported to have defaulted any of the lenders be it the banks or the small finance banks or the commercial banks nabard at nhm exim bank any of them so the lenders shall review the borrower account within 30 days from such default so there is a review period of 30 days by these lenders if the borrower has defaulted against any of the lender so lenders may decide on the resolution strategy or the nature of the resolution plan during this period and lenders can also choose to initial legal proceedings for insolvency or the recovery now what are the timelines for the same if company if a borrower company or a debtor company has an aggregate exposure of more than 2000 crore rupees then the review period of 30 days will start from june 7 to 2019 if the aggregate exposure is between 1500 crores to 2000 crores then the review period of 30 days will start from january 1 2020 and for the aggregate borrowing for the debtor company of less than 1500 crore their aggregate exposure is less than 1500 crore so there is no defined timeline as of now now we are going to talk about the amendments which has been proposed so the first amendment is that from the time frame of 180 plus 90 days that was 270 days and that to without litigation time the time frame has been now 330 days but it includes the time for litigation so although the time frame has been increased from 270 days to 330 days or we can say 180 plus 90 days to 330 days but now 330 days involves the time of litigation whereas 180 plus 90 days uh, do not allow for the time of litigation so as we have discussed here that if the process is not completed within the time frame now 330 days so the order will be passed for the liquidation of the company now the another amendment is that in the uh, the confusion arises because of the sr steel matter in the sr steel the n class uh, put different classes of creditors at par so secured creditor unsecured creditor operational creditor financial creditor so these all were put at the same footing at uh, at par uh, in the sr steel matter but there was a clarification in the amendments and the clarification talks about that 
unsecured financial creditors and the operational creditors they need not be treated on par with the secured financial creditors so the unsecured financial creditors and operational creditors they should not be treated at par with the secured financial creditors so this was the second amendment and this amendment came because of the nsr steel matter confusion so one amendment also was there to clarify that the resolution plan which the committee of creditors will bring in that will be binding on all the stakeholders and by all the stakeholders it means that including the central government the state government local authorities everyone who owes the debt to the bankrupt company will be binded by the decision taken by the committee of creditors and here uh, it is written that 270 days uh, is, ex- is was the resolution process time but it excluded the litigation period time which i have discussed with you and also we have discussed that the average recovery time in india is 4.3 years which is very high when compared to uk and us coming on to the next amendment here so the amendment say that if the financial creditors uh, does not vote in favor of a rescue plan or or of that of operational creditors so the debtor company will be liquidated and as on the liquidation date the claims to various creditors will be as per the hierarchy specified in ipc so we look at the hierarchy now so firstly those who have brought the interim finance to meet the cost of liquidation they are on the first priority second the dues to workers for last 24 months that is 2 years and dues to secured creditors then we have employees employees here are for 12 months other than the workman unsecured and operational creditors then after this it comes government dues then unsecured and operational creditors and then after it we have preference shareholders then we have equity shareholders so this is the hierarchy which has been mentioned in the ibc so to sum it up this amendment says that if the financial creditor does not vote in favor of a rescue plan then the company will be liquidated and the liquidation will be held as per the hierarchy so the claims that the various creditors will be getting will be according to the hierarchy mentioned and i have already discussed with you the hierarchy now the next amendment that i'll be discussing about is that the decision taken by the committee of creditors will be binding on the central state and the local governments so what is the purpose behind this the purpose is that no state authority even the income tax officials or no the or no government official can question a rescue plan which has been adopted by the committee of creditors in a court monitored process of ibc the next amendment we are talking about is to make decision making easier so we know that there are companies like jp and many other companies which have large number of creditors like home buyers many bond holders so what this amendment says is that the purpose is that as large number of shareholders cannot take part in the voting of committee of creditors so even if the half of these creditors that is the home buyers or bond holders so even if the half of these creditors who are present approve a plan then it will be considered that the entire class of such creditors has approved it so we know that these creditors are very huge in number very large in number and they do not take part in voting everyone cannot take part in the voting so example i have given you is of jp so jp has 58% home buyer so according to this amendment if 29% at least 29% of the home buyers who are present approve of a plan then the decision taken by this 29% is applicable to the whole lot of 58% as it is written that it be considered that the entire class of creditors has approved it so this decision by taken by the 29% will be taken that 58% the whole class of creditors has approved the decision if at least 29% has approved of it 
Now the code of conduct. We have discussed the three thirty day deadline. We have discussed the rights of all creditors clarified. That the unsecured creditors and the operational creditors will not be taken at par with the secured financial creditors, uh, which was the confusion in the S R Steel Limited case. Then we have I B C decisions binding on all the governments, so that no authority can question the bankruptcy resolution taken by the committee. And M N A's are part of the bankruptcy resolution, which gives flexibility to new investors in the bankrupt. company and which increases the confidence also so there are some clarifications which we have discussed in brief that the 330 day deadline includes the legal challenges and uphold the secured creditors priority right on sale or liquidation proceeds so in short it means that the 330 day timeline includes any legal challenges or the time for litigation which has been excluded in the 270 day deadline in the earlier version of ibc and the earlier 270 day timeline applied to only the coc approving a resolution and not to subsequent litigation which we have talked about now so new 330 day timeline as we have said it includes a time for litigation as well so which implies that it applies to judges as well to courts as well because the time for litigation the time for judgment so the entire 330 day timeline includes the day when the application has been accepted by nclt till the time some decision and the implementation of that decision has taken place including the time for litigation by the courts and judges as well now if there is a delay which was there earlier in the 270 day mechanism that in 180 days the plan is ready Final plan is ready, and if the NCLT deems fit and deems that 90 days is has to be extended to a company for a resolution process, actually that time of delay was because of the litigation process. So, the delay between the COC's approval of a plan and NCLT bench approval caused the lenders a lot of money. So, I'll tell you how. So, there is a company, say A. against which the case is there of bankruptcy and there are various lenders of this company so if the delay is there if the lenders are not getting their money back because of the delay in the litigation process or delay due to any reason then these lenders will suffer a loss because there is a notional loss present here had the money been given on time to these lenders these lenders could have invested it somewhere else and made money out of the interest but now as their money is blocked here due to the litigation process being delayed so these lenders suffer a notional loss for example in case of bhushan power and steel where the financial creditors are expected to receive rupees 19350 crore every day of delay leads to a notional loss of 4.2 crore so on a every day basis based on the marginal cost lending rate of 8.5 person lenders suffered a notional loss of 4.2 crore per day which is a very huge loss so the lenders have to bear the loss just because of the delay in the process so we'll talk about the criticism now so presently one in every three insolvency cases in nclt has crossed its 270 day deadline just because of the court process another 60 days have been given so that the courts can settle last minute litigation so it is 270 days plus 60 days more for the courts so that they can settle the last minute litigation then we have nclt and nclat so these two tribunals are there this is national company law tribunal and this is national company law appellate tribunal so difference between these two are that all the evidences for the case is given to the nclt nclt makes a decision and this decision will be reviewed by nclat so this forum is superior to nclt so the criticism another criticism is that in nclt and nclat they are overloaded with the matters first the number of members in the benches are very few and second there are so many stakeholders involved like 
financial creditors, operational creditors, government agencies, existing promoters, shareholders. So benches are few and the stakeholders, the number of stakeholders are very large. So solving such a complex case with very few benches is a challenge for NCLT. Now what are the suggestions that insolvency bankruptcy code should appoint new benches, should increase the bandwidth of the judicial system and it requires multidisciplinary expertise. So there is a news that in Amravati new bench will be opened up. So this is all for today. Thank you.